the morning and I want to wish everybody a happy or blessed Good Friday. Uh, today as we really give appreciation to what Christ did for us on the cross, I want to draw our attention to something very specific. And it's the idea of why does Jesus have to have his side pierced? I promise you that if you listen through this video, you will never view Jesus' side being pierced in the same way. I want to really explain what is the significance of this. I can tell you this, in order to understand the significance of Christ having his side pierced, you have to understand the significance of Jesus being the new Adam. And in order to understand Jesus as the new Adam, we have to go back and view the first Adam. The Bible is very clear uh, that we are saved through what's known as recapitulation. Paul talks about this in Ephesians. And what that means is we go from being under the headship of the first Adam who disobeyed God and he brought sin into the world. We go from that headship to when we're saved, we end up going under the headship of Jesus. Jesus is the new Adam. He did not sin against God, yet he did the will of his father. He does not bring us death, but he brings us life. Um, St. Paul makes this also very clear in his letter to the Romans. So let's look at the first Adam, though, and see exactly how he brought us death. Well, we know that Adam was created, uh, made from the dirt, and he was given life. Adam was put as really in this lordship over all of creation. His job was to tend the garden. He gets put to sleep. His uh, bride, Eve, is taken from the side of Adam. Adam. Uh, uh, there's a bone from his rib that is uh, taken from Adam, and then this is where Eve is made from. Um, what Adam does is he neglects his job as being a protector of Eve. He allows Eve to be duped by uh, Satan. And then, therefore, Eve is, once she is uh, tempted and falls into the sin that Satan tempts her with from eating from the tree of the knowledge of uh, good and evil, Eve is going to then uh, offer this to Adam, and Adam's going to partake of this. It's very important to understand you know, Eve was the one who ate from the apple or from the fruit first, not Adam. Paul makes this clear in, in Corinthians, you know, where he says it was, you know, the woman who was deceived, you know, by the serpent. And then in a certain way, you could say that the man was deceived by uh, the woman. Yet, even though Eve, who is the mother of the living, even though Eve uh, is the first one to sin... We never see St. Paul say, because of one woman, sin entered into the world. He never says this. He, he really does, never puts the blame of us receiving our sin uh, because of Eve. Because Eve never had that captain position. We were never under the umbrella of Eve as we were under the umbrella of Adam. So therefore, Adam as our head, Adam uh, being under the capitulation of Adam, we also are born receiving the guilt of Adam. And not only that, but then of course the, uh, you know, we get credited, you know, with the guilt of Adam, but not only that, but then the actual twisted sinfulness that comes from them eating the fruit this concupiscence, we call it, this desire to sin, this disordered temptation to sin, we all inherit that also. So when you're born, you're born, before you commit a sin, you're born as guilty because you are under the guilty condemnation of Adam. Number two, that defect is in you already too. You will want to sin. Sinning is going to be part of your fallen nature. How are we saved then? Well, basically the salvation of the Bible 
is the understanding that you leave the capitulation or the headship of Adam and you enter into the headship of Jesus. And if you enter into the headship of Jesus, where you uh, became a sharer in the guilt of Adam, now you will become a sharer in the righteousness of Christ. And where Adam brings death to everybody, Christ will bring life. It's really that simple. You go from Adam to Christ, and therefore, if you are in Christ, then as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you will be in Christ Jesus if the Spirit of Christ is in you. And now we don't have to be a slave to our flesh and to the desires of this disordered sin. Now we're freed from that and we can be guided by the Spirit that is placed in us. We don't have to follow the Spirit that's placed in us. And we can choose to go back to this, uh, to the desires and be led by the flesh. And then if you do, then you're like St. Peter said, you're like a dog who returns to his vomit. But what does this have to do with Jesus being crucified and having his side pierced? It's the understanding that Jesus has to take on these curses that were due to Adam and Jesus has to succeed where Adam failed. Adam's given really three major curses. He's given the curse of sweat. By the sweat of his brow, he would get his food. Jesus takes that curse on. Jesus actually sweats blood in the garden. He's filled with such anxiety in the garden that he is having blood pour out from his head. View this. The first Adam is placed in the garden. He's told to do the will of God, not to do his own will. Satan convinces Adam and Eve, do your will, not the will of God. This is still the official uh, slogan of the Church of Satan. It is just, let your will be done. Do your will. Um, so Adam fails in that. Jesus in the garden, the new Adam in the garden, what does he have to do? Why is he sweating? Because he knows what's coming up. And he has to say three times, Father, if it can, let this cup pass from me. But not my will be done, but your will. Jesus then uh, sub submits his human will over to the divine will. Remember, Jesus has two wills. He had a fully human uh, will and a fully divine will. So while he's walking on earth, he gets to this point where he submits his human will over to his divine will. Now, the other curse that Adam is given is given the curse of thorns. God tells him now, now that the earth will be cursed with thorns. These thorns represent death. Uh, it represents the punishment due to sin. What does Jesus do? Jesus actually is crowned with those thorns. He takes the sin of Adam and he actually crowns it. This is why you will hear uh, the church describe it as the oh happy fault. Because of Adam's sin, what God does with his mercy is he doesn't through Christ raise us back up to the original uh, state that Adam was in before he fell. He raises us up higher. Um, Adam was told that there were two trees in the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which he was told not to take from. And that if he took that, he would die. And then there's the tree, uh, the, there's the tree of life. God wants him to take from this tree. He wants Adam and Eve to take from this tree so that they can grow in this great union with, uh, with God. They do not choose that tree, but instead they choose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, we see that Jesus is not only crowned with the thorns, and not only that, but he sweats the blood. But the main curse given to Adam was death. That God tells Adam, man will live for so long, and then he will die. Man will have to have his soul severed from his body. Jesus takes this curse on. Jesus has his soul severed from his body. But how does this happen compared to Adam? 
Listen, Adam was given life. He was given life differently than the trees and the squirrels and the birds. Adam was given life because God breathed into Adam. Man became alive because God breathed into man. God gave his breath to man. How does Jesus die? Well, Jesus dies from crucifixion, but how did he die from crucifixion? He didn't bleed to death, although he could have. You know, he didn't just collapse and die because of the pain, although that would be understandable based on the torture that they did to him. Jesus died from suffocating. The way you die in crucifixion is your, your uh, chest cavity actually fills up with fluid and it collapses your lungs. You suffocate. So where Adam, the first Adam, was given the breath, was given life through by God giving him breath, Jesus, who is God, dies by man taking his breath. God gives breath to man. Man takes the breath of God. That's very significant. This is why on Easter Sunday, when Jesus raises from the dead, the very first thing he does is John chapter 20, is what does he do to the apostles? He breathes on them. This is his goal, is to bring back this divine life, this Zoe life that Adam had originally, but was taken uh, from him because of his rebellion against God. Jesus comes to give this Zoe life back. Now, the main focus I want to have in this video is why does Jesus, what does that have to do with Jesus being stabbed in the side? Well, because again, this idea of capitulation. When Adam was created and was brought to life, God wants Adam to have a bride. Adam goes to sleep, and while he goes to sleep, God enters into the side of Adam and takes from him the bone that will be Eve. And then God closes that opening in Adam. Now, it's kind of a weird analogy, but I want us to, to think about this. So God opens the side of Adam, takes out a bone. From this bone, this bone then will become Eve. Understand <clears throat> that everybody who's ever been born, every human that's ever been born, came from this bone because we all came from Eve. Eve is the bride of the first Adam, and she comes from his side when he's put to sleep. God enters into the side of Adam and makes an opening into Adam so that he could take this bone, and now God closes that door. Really, this idea of capitulation, this bone going from the first Adam to the new Adam is the purpose of this video. Where uh, Eve, the first Eve, comes from the side of Adam when he's put to sleep. When do we see Jesus put to sleep? Put to death on the cross. As soon as Adam was put to sleep, then God enters and makes an opening in the side of Adam. When the new Adam is put to sleep, or dies, on the cross, man, the weapon of man, makes an opening in the side of the new Adam. What came out of the first Adam? His bride. Who is the bride of the new Adam? Who is the bride of Christ? It's the church. The church is the bride of Christ. What comes out of Jesus? Well, what comes out of Jesus is blood and water. This is very symbolic of the blood that would come out, overflow out of the temple uh, when uh, the priest would go in and offer uh, the blood on the Day of Atonement. <clears throat> but not only that, but there was a river near there and the blood would mix with the water and it would flow out of the temple. Well, Jesus is the temple. He is the new temple. And when he's pierced, you, this blood and water comes out. We see in the Gospel of John, Jesus promises the woman of, at the well, you know, whoever comes to me, 
I will give them life-giving water. They will never thirst again. This life-giving water is understood as baptismal water that pours out, that saves us. And Titus talks about how we're washed by the, the bath of regeneration. Um, so not only do we see that, but another thing that Jesus does is at a wedding feast in the Gospel of John, he's going to turn holy water into this uh, unending amount of wine for the wedding feast. This is also very Eucharistic. So we see that Jesus gives us uh, this water, and Jesus gives us this this wine, which is his his blood. And this is what comes out of the side of the new Adam. <clears throat> what that is, is when Jesus has his side open, it's an opening for his bride to go into Jesus. This is the symbolism here. Is that, and we know that Paul says in Romans again that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In John chapter 15, Jesus talks about, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me, I will remain in him. It's this idea of you go from being a thorn branch that was uh, born by nature in this thorn bush, which represents Adam, you get cut off. You're a branch that's cut off from that thorn bush, and now you are grafted into the vine, which is Christ. This stabbing of Jesus on his side is to show that this is now the doorway into Christ. God made the opening of Adam so that he could take the bride of Adam out of Adam. And God then seals that opening because he doesn't want us going back into Adam. When Jesus' opening is made, not by God, but by the weapon of man, this is to create an opening for us, for his bride. This is the whole idea of salvation and recapitulation is all about you're born in Adam by nature, and basically what being saved is, or by being what being born again is, is it's leaving Adam, dying to yourself, and being brought to life in Christ. There's a reason why the two main sacraments of initiation for the church are baptism and the Eucharist and the Lord's Supper. And this is why when Jesus is stabbed, this is what comes out of him. Picture it almost like, as if you could think of like the Bat Cave, you know, where sometimes Batman has to drive his Batmobile on a ramp and it goes through this waterfall. And then on the other side of the waterfall, he enters into the Bat Cave. You could really kind of picture this as, you know, the blood and the water, these sacraments of initiation. As we leave Adam, and we die to Adam. You have to die. When a branch that's cut off of a thorn bush, I actually got a thorn bush right here. You know, these thorn bushes are, these branches are alive. By nature, they're going to produce thorns. If I were to cut this thorn bush branch, it would die. It would die. Unless you could cut that branch and it could be grafted into the vine, which is Christ. And now instead of receiving the energy and the nutrients and the life of the thorn bush, it's instead going to receive the life and the nature of the vine, which is Christ. We die to self and then through the sacraments of initiation, through uh, through our faith and baptism and the Lord's Supper, we truly are grafted into Christ. And that's what this whole idea of him being stabbed is. It's just basically Jesus is stabbed in the side so that there's an opening and a doorway into him for his new bride, the church. Hope this made sense to you guys. 
Thanks for watching. Peace out.